Hey everybody and welcome to There and Back Again. I'm Alistair Stevens. Tonight in our 66th session exploring Professor Tolkien's Middle Earth, we make it, hopefully, all the way to Arodruin. We make it to Amon Amarth. We make it to Mount Doom itself and to the crack slash cracks of Doom. We're never really sure whether that's a singular or a plural. It turns up in both forms throughout the book, so that's going to be fine. But we are going to talk, if we get to the end of tonight's reading, about other significant cracks too. More on that when we get to it. We have, of course, a long journey ahead of us. I was just discussing with the chat here before we started the podcast that I have an absolutely infeasible number of slides. So we may not make it through everything that I want to talk about tonight. I'd rather delay our final conclusion here with Frodo and Sam uh, for another week than uh, hurry through any of the material that we're covering. So we'll see how we do. We are going to continue our discussion, though, of chapter one of book six of The Lord of the Rings, The Tower of Kirith Ungol. And we're going to begin with the long-awaited rescue of Frodo. He was naked, lying as if in a swoon on a heap of filthy rags. His arm was flung up, shielding his head, and across his side there ran an ugly whip wheel. Frodo! Master Frodo, my dear! cried Sam, tears almost blinding him. It's Sam! I've come! He half lifted his master and hugged him to his breast. Frodo opened his eyes. Am I still dreaming? he muttered. But the other dreams were horrible. You're not dreaming at all, master, said Sam. It's real! It's me! I've come! I can hardly believe it, said Frodo, clutching him. There was an orc with a whip, and then it turns into Sam. Then I wasn't dreaming after all when I heard that singing down below, and I tried to answer. Was it you? It was indeed, Master Frodo. I'd given up hope almost. I couldn't find you. Well, you have now, Sam, dear Sam, said Frodo, and he lay back in Sam's gentle arms, closing his eyes like a child at rest when night fears are driven away by some loved voice or hand. Sam felt that he could sit like that in endless happiness. But it was not allowed. It was not enough for him to find his master. He, he had still to try and save him. He kissed Frodo's forehead. Come, wake up, Mr. Frodo, he said, trying to sound as cheerful as he had when he drew back the curtains at Bag End on a summer's morning. Frodo sighed and sat up. Where are we? How did I get here? He asked. There's no time for tales till we get somewhere else, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. But you're in the top of that tower you and me saw from away down by the tunnel before the, or the orcs got you. How long ago that was, I don't know, more than a day, I guess. Only that, said Frodo. It seems weak. Weeks. You must tell me all about it if we get a chance. Something hit me, didn't it? And I fell into darkness and foul dreams and woke and found that waking was worse. Orcs were all round me. I think they'd just been pouring some horrible burning drink down my throat. My head grew clear and I was aching and weary. They stripped me of everything. And then two great brutes came and questioned me, questioned me until I thought I should go mad, standing over me, gloating, fingering their knives. I'll never forget their claws and eyes. You won't if you talk about them, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. And I don't want to see them again the sooner, and if, you, if we don't want, excuse me, and if we don't want to see them again the sooner we get going, the better. Can you walk? Yes, I can walk, said Frodo, getting up slowly. I'm not hurt, Sam. Only I feel very tired and I have a pain here. He put his hand to the back of his neck above his left shoulder. He stood up and it looked to Sam as if he were clothed in flame. His naked skin was scarlet in the light of the lamp above. The torment of Frodo. Only a day has passed, a little more than a day, I guess, has passed in the uh, great temporal schema provided to us by Professor Tolkien, but Sam has finally found his master. Though finding his master, well, it's one of these moments when Sam sets himself a very simple goal. He sets himself, huh, perhaps not a simple goal, but a direct goal, an achievable goal, only to realize that that goal was just the first step in a much longer journey. This reunification between Frodo and Sam is, of course, enormously powerful, is, of course, enormously touching. And we get one of those rare moments when the narrative gives us profound insight into Frodo's emotional state. We don't usually do this unless we are in Frodo's POV. Tolkien actually plays pretty strictly by the rules of POV. He's willing to move from character to character within the same scene, but generally that is indicated by a, a forceful transition. We are in Sam's POV throughout the sequence. We're Spoiler is going to remain in Sam's POV for much of what is to come before we get to the cracks of doom right at the end there. But we get this nice push into Frodo's experience here. He lay back in Sam's gentle arms, closing his eyes like a child at rest when night fears are driven away by some loved voice or hand. Frodo is soothed here by Sam's presence, waking from his dreams, his horrible dreams, and finding, in fact, that the voice that he heard down below, you remember when Sam was singing last week, um, that, uh, that that song did reach Frodo and did offer him perhaps a measure of solace. He tried to respond, at least something within him was stirred to respond, even in the depths of his misery, even in the depths of his, his, his loneliness and despair here. He seeks to respond to Sam, and lo and behold, of course, Sam's song is the mechanism by which Sam finally finds his master and now prepares to lead him out. Let's, um, 
Yeah, yes, here we are, uh, Marshall calling out already. Uh, because to truly lose hope and give in to despair is an anathema to Tolkien. Denethor versus Eomer is a prime example, answering up to uh, up to Lily's point. Let me see if I can scroll back and find Lily. Um, yes, Lily's saying, I love that Sam only almost lost hope. Let's try and keep track tonight, I suppose, of the number of times that Sam almost loses hope or the number of times that Sam outright thinks that he has lost hope only for it to return, only for there to be some intervention of the world into Sam's personal experience that restores some measure of his hope, at least enough to get him back on his feet again. That happens all the time. It happens all the time through the sequence. And it really got me thinking this time, this reading of The Lord of the Rings, about how open Sam is to those moments of inspiration, to those moments of grace whereby hope is restored. It's not quite eucatastrophe, though it certainly springs from the same the same font, the same fountainhead, I suppose, as all you catastrophe. It's that notion that there is always hope, not just because we are sufficiently wise to understand that we are insufficiently wise to see all possible paths ahead. We cannot feel the despair that Gandalf describes because there is always doubt. We just don't know what is going to happen. And Sam's understanding that he understands too little to be sure, I suppose, does seem to be one means by which that grace can enter his experience, but one means by which his hope can be restored. He just doesn't know. He just, he, he does not count himself wise enough. He is not prideful enough or, or arrogant enough to believe that he understands the world perfectly, that he apprehends all possible outcomes to his given situation. So in part, this is about Sam's positive ignorance, I suppose, that that sounds much more harsh than I mean it to sound, but but certainly Sam's awareness of the lack of his own awareness, his his understanding that he is small and that the world is wide, that does seem to be one of the uh one of the means by which he is exposed repeatedly to this this recurring uh intervention of grace, I suppose, through his experience in Mordor. The other is that he is just open to the world. He sees more widely and understands more deeply than pretty much any other character in, well, certainly in this part of the book. I think there are other characters who see the world in a similar way to Sam. But if we're going to talk about characters who see the world in a similar way to Sam, we are going to have to elevate our register quite significantly because those characters include, well, I might argue Treebeard, for example. I might argue Gandalf, though certainly during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, during his time at Minas Tirith, Gandalf was quite the opposite. He is he is foreseeing doom and, and ill fate left and right, particularly as he's racing to the Houses of Healing to intercede on, uh, on Faramir's behalf with Denethor. Also, Tom Bombadil. I am reminded of Tom Bombadil in Sam's almost ha, huh, almost gleeful passage through the world. Of course, Sam is at this point not gleeful, right? Sam is not even happy at this point, but Sam is resolute. And one of the things that keeps him resolute is his connection to the world around him, not just his immediate circumstances, which may be where we can differentiate most powerfully between Sam and Tom, because Tom is connected only to his own little corner of the old forest, right? He doesn't stretch beyond his bounds in any meaningful sense. That's one of the arguments against Tom Bombadil, of course, being given the ring um, back in The Fellowship of the Ring. So Tom concerns himself only with his his immediate locale, only with the immediate vicinity of the old forest, but he is able to find within that old forest beauty. He is able to find within that old forest hope. Sam is able to do the same, of course, also concerned to a certain degree with his immediate surroundings as, as he moves through Mordor, but able to look beyond them, able to... Well, we are all of us in the gutter, but some of us are staring at the stars, to uh, paraphrase Oscar Wilde there. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, let's push on to um, to a, a recapitulation of a point that Frodo makes here in the first slide. They stripped me of everything, he said, and then two great brutes came and questioned me, questioned me until I thought I should go mad, standing over me, gloating, fingering their knives. I'll never forget their claws and eyes. They stripped me of everything, Frodo says, and we'll look at that in more depth right now. They've taken everything, Sam, said Frodo. Everything I had. Do you understand? Everything. He cowered on the floor again with bowed head as his own words brought home to him the fullness of the disaster and despair overwhelmed him. The quest has failed, Sam. Even if we get out of here, we can't escape. Only elves can escape away, away out of Middle Earth, far away over the sea, if even that is wide enough to keep the shadow out. No, not everything, Mr. Frodo. And it hasn't failed, not yet. I took it, Mr. Frodo, begging your pardon, and I've kept it safe. It's around my neck now, and a terrible burden it is, too. Sam fumbled for the ring and its chain. But I suppose you must take it back. Now it had come to it, Sam felt reluctant to give up the ring and burden his master with it again. 
You've got it, gasped Frodo. You've got it here? Sam, you're a marvel. Then quickly and strangely, his tone changed. Give it to me, he cried, standing up, holding out a trembling hand. Give it to me at once. You can't have it. All right, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, rather startled. Here it is. Slowly, he drew the ring out and passed the chain over his head. But you're in the land of Mordor now, sir. And when you get out, you'll see the fiery mountain and all. You'll find the ring very dangerous now and very hard to bear. If it's too hard a job, I could share it with you, maybe. No, no, cried Frodo, snatching the ring and chain from Sam's hands. No, you won't, you thief! He panted, staring at Sam with eyes wide with fear and enmity. Then suddenly, clasping the ring in one clenched fist, he stood aghast. A mist seemed to clear from his eyes, and he passed a hand over his aching brow. The hideous vision had seemed so real to him, half bemused as he still, as he was still with wound and fear. Sam had changed before his very eyes into an orc again, leering and pawing at his treasure, a foul little creature with greedy eyes and a slobbering mouth. But now the vision had passed. There was Sam kneeling before him, his face wrung with pain as if he had been stabbed in the heart. Tears welled from his eyes. Oh, Sam, cried Frodo, what have I said? What have I done? Forgive me. After all you've done, it is the horrible power of the ring. I wish it had never, never been found. But don't mind me, Sam. I must carry the burden to the end. It can't be altered. You can't come between me and this doom. So Frodo's wretchedness at the beginning of this slide comes from this understanding that everything has been taken, but he doesn't mean everything. He's not here mourning the loss of his cloak or mourning the loss of his blade or mourning the loss of his hobbit tunic. No, he's talking about the ring. Everything I had. Do you understand? Everything. And then we understand that he is talking about the ring because he immediately pivots. The quest has failed, Sam. Even if we get out of here, we can't escape. He's not talking about the trinkets that he carried with him into into Mordor. He is talking about Sauron's possession now of the One Ring. The orcs have taken it. They must be carrying it now to Barad-dûr. Sauron is going to regain it, and then that is it. That's the ball game, you guys. If Sauron gets the ring, there is nothing on on Middle Earth that can stand against him. Only the elves can escape away, away out of Middle Earth, far away over the sea. If even that is wide enough to keep the shadow out, Sam is going to suggest later, by implication, that probably the sea would be wide enough to keep the shadow out. That is to say that the shadow can never be great enough to encompass all that there is. We must remember, of course, at this point in Tolkien's Legendarium, that when we talk about crossing the sea, when we talk about sailing into the West, we're not literally talking about sailing into the West. Valinor is no longer a part of of, uh, Arda. The undying lands have been plucked from the earth during the fall of Numenor back at the end of the Second Age. So, It is unlikely that the shadow should extend so far, but certainly it would consume all of Middle-earth. It would consume all of Arda. And there is, Frodo seems to be right, no way of escaping. It doesn't matter where he goes. This echoes, of course, uh, Aragorn's words to Merry when he's telling Merry that he can't come with him, uh, can't come with them in the the great host of the West marching to Moranon. Doesn't matter. Like, if we fail... The shadow's going to find you. It's going to come to you, whether you're in Minas Tirith or you're in Edoras or you're in the Shire. It doesn't matter. Eventually, the shadow will fall upon you. Frodo seems to have an intuitive understanding of that. He has felt now for too long the power of the ring, yes, and also the power of the eye in distant Barador. Well, now much less distant than it used to be, Barador, I suppose. And he knows what is coming. But Sam reassures him. No, not everything, Mr. Frodo, and it hasn't failed, not yet. I took it, Mr. Frodo, begging your pardon. Begging your pardon. I am sorry for taking your possession. This is not a... This is not a uh, observation of a simple courtesy. I think that Sam is actually begging his pardon at this point. Sam is actually begging forgiveness for taking a, a, a possession of Frodo's. That is pretty far across the line for a servant and master relationship, actually. I've kept it safe. It's round my neck now and a terrible burden it is too. Sam fumbled for the ring and its chain, but I suppose you must take it back. I suppose you must take it back. We can sense Sam's reluctance in his dialogue as well as in his action. Now that it had come to it, Sam felt reluctant to give up the ring and burden his master with it again. Oh, poor Sam. He doesn't want to give this burden back to Frodo, which I think is absolutely true but is also almost certainly part of the influence of the ring. The ring does not want to be given up. The ring never wants to be given up. The ring, if it seeks to escape from its bearer, it will betray that bearer. It will betray Isildur at the Battle of the Gladden Fields. It will betray Gollum in the caves under the Misty Mountains. It has been passed from Bilbo to Frodo only in direst exigency, right? Only thanks to the constant and loving pressure of Gandalf and also the resistance of hobbits to the corruption of the ring in the first place. But even Sam here feels that reluctance. And we see the change in Frodo, of course, as well. Slowly, Sam draws out the ring and passes the chain over his head. And he's warning him, right? But you're in Mordor now. When I came over the pass into Mordor, when I could 
see the fiery mountain, when I could see Orodruin off in the distance, I knew that the ring was more powerful. It seemed that that line of sight has some kind of power for the ring. When you are within sight of 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 Orodruin, certainly, and Barador even more so, right? When you are here, it is even more powerful. You'll find it an even greater burden to bear. If it's too hard a job, I could share it with you, maybe. Again, I completely believe that Sam is wanting to share the burden. Like good Sam, untainted Sam, uncorrupted Sam also would want to share that burden and save his master the weight of the ring, at least from time to time. But also I wonder about the influence of the ring. Also, I wonder about the ring wanting to stay with Sam as much as we can say that the ring wants to stay with anyone. And that is enough for Frodo to be triggered into this, into this rage. No, you won't, you thief. And this, this, takes him for a moment. This this fury and anger takes him for a moment. He has this vision of Sam as an orc slavering and, and, and wretched, pawing at his possessions, and then it passes. He is himself again for just a moment. Oh, Sam, what have I said? What have I done? Forgive me after all that you have done. It's the horrible power of the ring. I wish that it had never, never been found. It's interesting. <sighs> it's interesting, I suppose, that Frodo uses the word found there. I wish that it had never, never been found. I wish that it had never come to me would make a lot of sense. I wish that it had never come to Bilbo makes a lot of sense. But it had never been found it sends us back 500 years. It sends us back to the banks of the Anduin with Diego fishing out the, the, the ring from the bottom of the, of the river and, of course, being immediately murdered for his pains by Smeagol, who takes the ring. That is the finding of the ring. That, and again, perhaps another instance of the ring potentially at least betraying a, a ring bearer. Deagle holds the record for, for ring bearer for the shortest period of time, I suppose. But uh, the finding of the ring anchors us in an understanding of Frodo at this point. He feels pity for himself. Yes, I wish that it had never, never been found. It, it's the horrible power of the ring. This is a huge burden that I am carrying. Sam, a huge burden that you have carried, a huge burden that Bilbo carried, and a huge burden that Gollum carried. And we're going to, in the course of this week's reading, hopefully, catch up with Gollum at the Cracks of Doom and be reminded of pity, be reminded of empathy, be reminded of what it was that saved Gollum's life back before the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, right? Back in, in the, uh, the relatively distant past of, of this story. And most importantly, we are going to see Sam find within him an unprecedented spark of sympathy, an unprecedented spark of pity for Gollum. We're going to get to all of that much later. But even in this, in this instance, where Frodo is just kind of clawing back his his own sense of self and his own sense of his personality, right? When he is trying to make amends with Sam, what have I said? What have I done? Forgive me after all that you have done. Even then, he's thinking of Gollum and he's thinking of the, the ever-growing, encroaching corruption of the ring. Yeah. Uh, let me see here as I scroll back through. Um, <laughs> photo of the Nine Fingers. <laughs> We're going to get to all of that. Yes, good, good. Um, let me see. Uh, the Artful Fox saying the ring equal, equals stalker girlfriend meme. Yeah, the, st it, the ring just doesn't want to be let go, right? That's exactly right. Exactly right. And Nikki saying, enter scary movie Bilbo's reaction in Rivendell here. Yeah, right. That that A gif that I have seen now possibly more often than any other gif from The Lord of the Rings because it was so fleetingly popular on, on Twitter for a while there. But yes, that, that rage-fueled response from Bilbo, exactly the response that, that Frodo is having in this moment. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Okay. Let's get to uh, our next slide. Drops and morsels here. I can't go all the way to run, Sam, said Frodo with a wry smile. I hope you've made inquiries about inns along the road, or have you forgotten about food and drink? Save me, but so I had, said Sam. He whistled in dismay. Bless me, Mr. Frodo, but you've gone and made me hungry and thirsty. I don't know when drop or morsel last passed my lips. I'd forgotten it trying to find you, but let me think. Last time I looked, I'd got about enough of that whey bread and of what Captain Faramir gave us to keep me on my legs for a couple of weeks at a pinch. But if there's a drop left in my bottle, there's no more. And there's not going to be enough for two, no how. Don't orcs eat and don't they drink? Or do they live on foul air and poison? No, they eat and drink, Sam. The shadow that bred them can only mock. It cannot make. Not real new things of its own. I don't think it gave life to the orcs. It only ruined them and twisted them. And if they are to live at all, they have to live like other living creatures. Foul waters and foul meats they'll take if they can get no better. But not poison. They fed me, and so I am better off than you. There must be food and water somewhere in this place. But there's no time to look for them, said Sam. Well, things are a bit better than you think, said Frodo. I had a bit of luck while you were away. Indeed, they did not take everything. 
I found my food bag among some rags on the floor. They rummaged it, of course, but I guess they disliked the very look and smell of the Lembus worse than Gollum did. It's scattered about and some of it is trampled and broken, but I've gathered it together. It's not far short of what you've got. But they've taken Faramir's food and they've slashed up my water bottle. Well, there's no more to be said, said Sam. We've got enough to start on, but the water's going to be a bad business. But come, Mr. Frodo, off we go or a whole lake of it won't do us any good. Not till you've had a mouthful, Sam, said Frodo. I won't budge. Here, take this elven cake and drink the last drop in your bottle. The whole thing is quite hopeless, so it's no good worrying about tomorrow. It probably won't come. Food and drink. I, I love, I'm going to spend just a second on Frodo's hobbitishness here. Frodo guarding himself from the shadow, guarding himself from the darkness with that wry hobbit wit is enormously restorative for me as a reader. I am feeling like it's been a long time since we had any any hobbitry in this novel at all, and it's nice to get just a little whisper of it. I can't go all the way to run, uh, Sam, said Frodo with a wry smile. I hope you've made inquiries about inns along the road. This is fantastic. This is, this is Fellowship of the Ring, conspiracy unmasked kind of Frodo here. This is that gentle teasing that we associate with good friends. This is also as close as gentle teasing, uh, as close to gentle teasing as we get between Frodo and Sam. Of course, we talked about this way back, a million years ago, back in the Fellowship of the Ring, with Merry and Pippin and Frodo pretty much constantly teasing each other, which they can do because they are of similar rank. But no one teases Sam, because to tease Sam against, uh, against and across those lines of rank would be disrespectful. It would be uh, actual mockery instead of friendly and affectionate teasing. Here, Frodo's kind of leaning in that direction. It's an enormously intimate thing for him to do with Sam at this point. But of course, we're not quite at the uh, the Merry and Pippin level of, uh, of teasing each other as we go forward. Or have you forgotten about food and drink? And it turns out that Sam has, in fact, completely forgotten about food or drink. Um, I don't know when drop or morsel last passed my lips. According to the narrative, the last time that Sam ate or drank was in chapter 8 of book 4 of The Lord of the Rings, The Stairs of Kirith Ungol. Now, that feels like a very long time. It turns out, though, well, I mean, it kind of is a very long time. It was four days ago. That happened on March 11th, and it is now early on March 15th, which is, of course, a very significant date, which we'll uh, spend a little more time on uh, spend a little more time on later. But yes, four days, apparently, for Sam without food or drink. Now, of course, we haven't been with Sam that whole time. It is possible that he, you know, sat back for a moment. He paused just a second between books four and six of The Lord of the Rings and had a little snack. But yes, if that is the case, then he has had perhaps one drop and one morsel in the last four days. But yeah, Sam is is shaky on his feet at this point. That, though, is not the most significant thing about this slide. The most significant thing about this slide is probably the cleanest perspective on orcs that we get in the entire book. The shadow that bred them can only mock it cannot make, not real new things of its own. I don't think it gave life to the orcs, it only ruined them and twisted them. And if they are to live at all, they have to live like other living creatures. Foul waters and foul meats they'll take if they can get no better, but not poison. Treebeard asserts something fairly similar about orcs and their heritage, in fact, in the course of this book. But we must be careful to distill out the voices of characters in this book versus the voice of the author in this book. And even then, the voice of the author in this book, from its, you know, the hobbity perspective, um, from the actual world-building impulse of J.R.R. Tolkien. Frodo is convinced in this moment that because the shadow cannot make, it can only mock that the orcs must have been regular living creatures, probably elves at some point in the distant past, right? Perhaps man, perhaps some weird, awful hybrid between men and elves, but that they were more natural at some point in the past and that they have been turned, that they have been corrupted. Thus they eat and drink because they are regular living creatures. Now, of course, dwarves are also created creatures that are somewhat less natural and somewhat less intentional than the elves and the men of Middle Earth, and they need to eat and drink. So we might not go too far down that road in terms of our speculation about the sources of orcs. I must say that I found, um, I was reading through uh, the bound volume of Professor Tolkien's letters, and I found this fantastic letter um, written on the 12th of May, 1965, in response to uh, W.H. Auden, the, the famous poet, who had written to Professor Tolkien, uh, praising him for the Lord of the Rings in general, but also wondering if his depiction of the orcs as essentially evil and irredeemably wicked, I think is the phrase that W.H. Auden uses, if that isn't, in Tolkien's Christian schema and to his Christian sensibilities, 
somewhat heretical. If things are created that are irredeemably wicked, that suggests that God is at the very least fallible, and that stands against uh, Tolkien's established theology. This is the response that Professor Tolkien wrote to W.H. Auden in 1965. Quote, with regard to the Lord of the Rings, I cannot claim to be a sufficient theologian to say whether my notion of orcs is heretical or not. I don't feel under any obligation to make my story fit with formalized Christian theology, though I actually intended it to be consonant with Christian thought and belief, which is asserted, which is asserted somewhere. Book 5, page 190, where Frodo asserts that the orcs are not evil in origin. We believe that, I suppose, of all human kinds and sons and breeds, though some appear both as individuals and groups to be, by us at any rate, unredeemable. So he's saying here, A maybe maybe in the real world orcs the 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 notion of orcs would be heretical but this is a secondary creation and have you read my foreword to the second edition of the lord of the rings and have you read on fairy stories and do you understand you know my mythopoeic impulse and what it is that i am trying to do i can write about heretical things in a way that is not actually heretical even if this thing would be actually heretical but he does want his world to be as he says consonant with christian thought and belief and then references this exact passage and that consonance, I suppose, is as powerful an implication for me that the orcs were in fact corrupted as any other piece of evidence that we might get in the story. I'm actually fairly skeptical of Frodo's assertion that this is the case, not skeptical of its truth, but skeptical of Frodo's authority to offer such an assertion and, and Frodo's you know, ability to understand the, the underlying workings of Middle Earth, I suppose. And I kind of feel the same way about Treebeard too. That idea though, that it is Tolkien's intent to respect Christian theology, even if he's not going to formalize it, even if he's not going to write a, a strictly allegorical work here within the frame of the Lord of the Rings, he still wants to reflect Christian thought and ideals, thought and belief, as he says in the letter, then I am inclined to see the orcs as corruptions because the shadow cannot make, it can only mock. That seems to be that seems to be a very deft bit of, of theological reconciliation here. Why are there evil creatures? Why is there an entire race of irredeemably evil creatures in Middle-earth? Because they were corrupted from something good. That is the source of, of all evil in Middle-earth, we might argue, right? We might speculate that that is the source of all evil in Middle-earth, that the original creative impulse in Middle-earth, as Tolkien believed in the real world, is pure and good, and that the evil that springs from the world is of the world in that sense, that it is it is always corruptive, it is always due to the fallibility of, of those beings which were created, whether we're talking about, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, or we're talking about, you know, Sauron or, or Melkor, I suppose, twisting the first found elves into something darker, into something, uh, into something much worse. Yeah, this is interesting. Lily saying, I read the same line the opposite way. The orcs are mockeries of life, not truly life. That's a completely fair reading of this too, right? That means that Frodo is wrong in his assertion, right? That, that Frodo's, uh, Frodo's deduction here that, well, the shadow can't make new life, so he didn't give them life, he just perverted pre-existing life to evil, but that means that they have to live by the rules of regular living creatures, that is, they need food and they need water, and hey, they're not fussy and they're actually kind of gross, so they will take foul food and foul water when they have nothing better, but they would prefer something better, but they won't eat poison and they won't eat rocks and they won't, you know, like they still need sustenance of, of a sort, which is again confirmed by the narrator later in this week's reading. I take that to be a pretty powerful, uh, a pretty powerful example. Yeah. Arful Fox saying, I don't think that we're created as spirits at all. Um, are we thinking of of the, uh, oh, Marshall is asking, I guess this is in response to Marshall, is it possible the orcs might just be fallen spirits like the Maiar who became Sauron and the Balrogs, but a further level of power down? I don't think that we have an account of Maiar who are, um, of Maiar who are as insignificant as the orcs, I suppose, is what I can, I can put it no more charitably than that, right? The Maiar are powerful. I mean, they are, you know, not as powerful as the Valar, but they are in the same order of beings as the Valar. And I don't know that we have, what is it? Who, who or what is the least powerful Maya, uh, least powerful Maya that we have seen in the frame of Middle Earth? I mean, I'm tempted to say Radagast the Brown, right? I'm tempted to kind of go there, but I'm not sure that that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe there is some fragmentation of a corrupted Maiar spirit. But even then, the, the notion of corruption, the notion of the fall, would apply to the orcs there as freely as it does to Sauron. Is Sauron irredeemably wicked? 
Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one right there because he was good at the beginning. He was pure at the beginning and then he was corrupted himself. The same can be said of the Balrogs. The same can be said of, of the dragons to a certain extent. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that isn't just kind of uh, kicking this, this question of morality, uh, kicking the can of this question of morality a little further down the road. But yeah, it's an interesting thought. Yes, yes. All right, let's, um, let's keep moving on to our last slide of chapter one, back to the Watchers. At length, they came to the door upon the outer court and they halted. Even from where they stood, they felt the malice of the Watchers beating on them, black, silent shapes on either side of the gate through which the glare of Mordor dimly showed. As they threaded their way among the hideous bodies of the orcs, each step became more difficult. Before they had even reached the archway, they were brought to a stand. To move an inch further was a pain and a weariness to will and limb. Frodo had no strength for such a battle. He sank to the ground. I can't go on, Sam, he murmured. I'm going to faint. I don't know what's come over me. I do, Mr. Frodo. Hold up now, it's the gate. There's some devilry there. But I got through and I'm going to get out. It can't be more dangerous than before. Now for it. Sam drew out the elven glass of Galadriel again. As if to do honour to his hardihood and to grace with splendour splendor his faithful brown hobbit hand that had done such deeds, the file blazed forth suddenly, so that all the shadowy court was lit with a dazzling radiance like lightning. But it remained steady and did not pass. Gilthoniel! Uh, Elbereth! Sam cried. For why he did not know, his, his thought sprang back suddenly to the elves in the Shire and the song that drove away the black rider in the trees. Aya Lenion and Kalima! cried Frodo once again behind him. The will of the Watchers was broken with a suddenness like the snapping of a cord, and Frodo and Sam stumbled forward. Then they ran. Through the gate and past the great seated figures with their glittering eyes, there was a crack. The keystone of the arch crashed almost on their heels, and the wall above crumbled and fell in ruin. Only by a hair did they escape. A bell clanged, and from the Watchers there went up a high and dreadful wail. Far up above in the darkness it was answered. Out of the black sky there came dropping like a bolt a winged shape, rending the clouds with a ghastly shriek. So, the destruction of the Watchers, thanks to the uh, the judicious application of the file of Galadriel, I suppose. Um, we are, of course, uh, singing to, calling out to, borderline praying to Varda here in her form as uh, as Elbereth. Gilthoniel, uh, Elbereth, Sam cried, for why he did not know his thoughts sprang back suddenly to the elves in the Shire and the song that drove away the Black Rider in the trees. For why he did not know? I mean, that's a pretty strong kind of one-to-one -one connection there. He felt at the time, we all felt at the time, that the elf song, as they're, they're passing through the Shire, drives away the Black Riders. And this is a useful quote. This is a useful, uh, a useful repetition of a phrase there that is obviously also connected intimately to the file of Galadriel. Guthoniel uh, Elbereth, uh, Elbereth Starkindler. Starkindler Elbereth is the, uh, the cry that he sends out. And um, Frodo, Aya, Elenian, and Kalima is uh, Hail, brightest of stars. You'll remember that Frodo Frodo cries out, uh, cried Frodo once again behind him. Frodo is actually echoing his own words from the encounter with Shelob when he cries out, Aya Eärendil, Elenian and Kalima, there, the, the kind of the more formal use of that. But hail brightest of stars as he fought Shelob, hail Eärendil, brightest of stars, he's still echoing that same sense. They're summoning forth the... Uh, the power of the file of Galadriel, the power of Varda, the power of the light to drive away the darkness. And they drive away the darkness pretty damn emphatically, actually. They bring down the keystone of the arch. They bring ruin and downfall behind them, even though the Watchers in that moment, weirdly, unsettlingly, eldritchly sentient, that so they may be, you know, they, they send out this cry that summons forth the Nazgul from above. It's... Uh, it's a pretty fantastic moment, echoing, of course, Sam passing through the first time. Yeah, good, good. Um, oh, are we talking about the creepiest things in all of uh, in all of the Lord of the Rings? Um, Sea Star saying the Barrow White with its poem was the creepiest thing in the Lord of the Rings to me. Yeah, that was super creepy. Um, the Watchers are pretty high up on that list. I've got to tell you, for me personally. Um, Gosh, the creepiest things. I mean, Sheila takes some beating, you guys, right? Like, I'm not uh, a natural. Uh, I'm not a natural arachnophobe, I suppose, but Shelob is still pretty, pretty dark. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, the creepiest moment? The creepiest moment for me may be the coming of uh, of Durin's Bane, the, the Balrog in Khazad-dûm. Not the actual battle itself, not once he is revealed, but I suppose everything up to the reveal is incredibly creepy for me, as as he is, you know, this this shape of smoke and fire coming through the massed rank of the orcs. That's, that's yeah, that's pretty terrifying. That's pretty unsettling. The ring wraiths too, of course. Uh, yeah. Anytime someone sniffs, any any sniffing that happens, pretty bad. Like, that's not a good thing. Yes. This is Jackie saying here, yeah, the sniffing, the sniffing wins. Yes, absolutely. 
good. All right. Um, Nikki said, yes, the sniffing. Um, Marshall saying, have you have I shared with you guys the theory that Tom Bombadil is actually an ancient and terrifying evil power? It's not something I came up with, but there's a really good essay hypothesizing it. And a link here. Thank you. I'll uh, open that link right now and remember to uh, share that in the show notes after the uh, podcast goes out. I haven't heard of that theory, but of course, it is the internet. So every theory has been suggested by someone out there, right? Everyone has written their own pet theory about who is secretly evil or who is secretly good, right? Maybe uh, maybe the Witch King of Angmar was understood, all, uh, misunderstood all those years and was actually working for the forces of light against Sauron. I'm sure if you did a close and very selective textual read, then you could find proof to support that. Let's move into chapter two. Let's get to, uh, to poor, helpless uh, Frodo here as we move forward. Look here, Sam, dear lad, said Frodo. I am tired, weary, and I haven't a hope left. But I have to go on trying to get to the mountain as long as I can move. The ring is enough. This extra weight is killing me. It must go. But don't think I'm ungrateful. I hate to think of the foul work you must have done among the bodies to find it for me. Don't talk about it, Mr. Frodo. Bless you. I'll carry you on my back if I could. Let it go, then. Frodo laid aside his cloak and took off the orc mail and flung it away. He shivered a little. What I really need is something warm, he said. It's gone cold or else I've caught a chill. You can have my cloak, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. He unslung his pack and took out the elven cloak. How's this, Mr. Frodo, he said. You wrap that orc rag close around you, you put the belt outside it, then this can go over all. It don't look quite orc fashion, but it'll keep you warmer, and I dare say it'll keep you from harm better than any other gear. It was made by the lady. Frodo took the cloak and fastened the brooch. That's better, he said. I feel much lighter. I can go on now. But this blind dark seems to be getting into my heart. As I lay in prison, Sam, I tried to remember the brandywine, the woody end, and the water running through the mill at Hobbiton. But I can't see them now. There now, Mr. Frodo, it's you that's talking of water this time, said Sam. If only the lady could see us or hear us, I'd say to her, Your ladyship, all we want is light and water. Just clean water and plain daylight better than any jewels, begging your pardon. But it's a long way to Lorien. Sam sighed and waved his hand back toward the heights of the Eiffel Duath, now only to be guessed as a deeper blackness against the black sky. Frodo casting off his orc mail here. Of course, his mithril shirt has been taken, and he is uh, he is armored by Sam uh, by the the looting of Samwise Gamgee. To uh, he is he is gifted with this this orc mail that he just can't wear anymore. It doesn't matter. The ring is enough, he says. Right, I have to go on trying to get to the mountain as long as I can move. The ring is enough. This extra weight is killing me. The physical burden of the ring at this point. This is not. I think Frodo speaking metaphorically, of course, Sam was already aware of the physical weight of the ring. The closer you get to Mount Doom, physically, the heavier it becomes. This extra weight is killing me. It must go, but don't think I'm ungrateful. I hate to think of the foul work you must have had among the bodies to find it for me. This is Frodo expressing in a courteous and gentle manner his need to Sam, while also respecting very much the actions of his servant, right? I'm certain that, that Frodo does hate to think of the foul work that Sam must have done taking these uh, these possessions from the orcs. Sam, of course, still carrying his pack. We'll get to that in due course, but he takes out the elven cloak, wraps it around Frodo. Frodo clasps it with the little elven brooch and feels immediately much lighter. Not, I think, just because he has taken off the orcish mail and cast it aside and replaced it with a, a, a cloak of Lothlorien, but because the cloak itself is enchanted, right? It'll keep you warmer, and I dare say it'll keep you from harm better than any other gear. It was made by the lady, says Sam. Sam demonstrating, again there, his unshakable faith in, in the Lady Galadriel. And then we get the, uh, the sinking under the shadow of Frodo. I feel much lighter. I can go on now. But this blind dark seems to be getting into my heart. As I lay in prison, Sam, I tried to remember the brandy wine and woody end and the water running through the mill at Hobbiton, but I can't see them now. Frodo is cut off from exactly the kinds of memories that are that that have been sustaining well, not just Sam, actually. These are the kinds of memories that sustained Bilbo all the way to the end of his adventure. But of course, Bilbo was not afflicted by, well, the wound from the Morgul blade, never mind carrying the ring into Mordor too. But memories like this have been sustaining Sam all the way through, and will continue to sustain Sam, uh, sustain Sam excuse me, as we move forward. But Frodo was now cut off from those. He cannot see the past. And there is, there is a really interesting uh, and, and, and quite complex idea. I'm, I'm not at all sure that I've completely unpicked this, right? But we've been talking so much about despair and about hope, and I've been thinking about the interaction of past and present and future in the context of hope and despair and to take that one step further, I suppose, into defiance too. In order to hope, 
we have to have a sense of the mutability of our circumstances. We have to have the sense that change is possible. If change is impossible, if, if nothing is ever going to be any different, if we live isolated in this, this austere and oppressive now, which is where Frodo is right now, right? Frodo can't think of anything or is having trouble, increasing trouble, thinking of anything that is happening outside of the now, outside of this, this sharp edged and brutal moment of experience. And because he can't think outside of the now, he can't have that sense of change. And without that sense of the possibility of change, there is no possibility of hope. This, I think, is one of the one of the more kind of complex and treacherous ideas about hope that is presented to us in the course of the book. And I really need to think about this more. So perhaps we'll circle back around to this at a, uh, at a future date when we can get into some Q and a after the, uh, after the, uh, the whole discussion, uh, Wilhelm scream actually anticipating, uh, a next move here. Isn't it interesting that in this entire tome, all three huge books, we have a main character, Frodo, who just, w with just about absolutely no love interest. Now that would be a tough sell these days. It absolutely would. Of course, we're going to get introduced to Sam love interest very weirdly in the span of the next couple of slides. So uh, let's get forward to there. Let's in fact move onward to March the 15th. I was going to talk about how significant this day is because other things are going on on March the 15th. It was the morning of the 15th of March and over the Vale of Anduin the sun was rising above the eastern shadow and the southwest wind was blowing. Theoden lay dying on the Pelennor fields. As Sam and Frodo stood and gazed, the rim of light spread all along the line of the Efelduath, and then they saw a shape moving at a great speed out of the west, at first only a black speck against the glimmering strip among the mountaintops, but growing, until it plunged like a bolt into the dark canopy and passed high above them. As it went, it sent out a long, shrill cry, the voice of a Nazgul. But this cry no longer held any terror for them. It was a cry of woe and dismay, ill tidings for the dark tower. The Lord of the Ringwraiths had met his doom. "'What did I tell you? Something's happening!' cried Sam. "'The war's going well,' said Shagrat, but Gorbag, he wasn't so sure, and he was right there, too. Things are looking up, Mr. Frodo. Haven't you got some hope now?' "'Well, no, not much, Sam,' Frodo sighed. "'That's a way beyond the mountains. We're going east, not west. And I'm so tired, and the ring is so heavy, Sam, and I begin to see it in my mind all the time like a great wheel of fire.' Sam's quick spirit sank again at once. He looked at his master anxiously, and he took his hand. "'Come, Mr. Frodo,' he said. I've got one thing I wanted, a bit of light, enough to help us, and yet I guess it's dangerous too. Try a bit further and then we'll lie close and have a rest, but take a morsel to eat now, a bit of the elves' food, it may hearten you. Sam again, turning to the elves and the, the, the work, the craft of the elves in order to raise his master's spirit here. Sam took the lessons that he learned in Lothlorien and the lessons that he learned in Rivendell very well indeed, it would seem. Elves, sir, the answer to pretty much any question that is asked you. So right now it is the morning of the 15th of March. Theoden lays dying on the Pelennor Fields, but that, of course, is not the only thing that happens at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. No, Merry and uh, Eowyn have just chalked up a major victory against the Witch King of Angmar, and here it is, the disembodied soul of the Witch King of Angmar, uh, the Witch King of Angmar passing east over the mountains of the Efelduath, passing all the way back to Barador, moving at great speed out of the west, at first only a black speck against the glimmering strip above the mountaintops, but growing until it plunged like a bolt into the dark canopy and passed high above them. As it went, it sent out a long, shrill cry, the voice of a Nazgul, but this cry no longer held any terror for them. It was a cry of woe and dismay, ill tidings for the Dark Tower. This is the death cry of the Witch King of Angmar, and Sam understands this lesson perfectly. Sam, of course, with no real context for this, right? All the information he has is that something that looks a lot like a Nazgul and sounds a lot like a Nazgul just hurtled overhead at very great speed. What is different here? Well, he doesn't feel the terror. He doesn't feel the dismay. He realizes by the, the, the sound of the shriek that this is different. This cry of woe and dismay, ill tidings for the dark tower. And Sam takes his hope in that. He takes his joy in that. He understands it. What did I tell you? Something's happening. The war is going well, said Shagrat. But Gorbag, he wasn't so sure and he was right there too. Things are looking up, Mr. Frodo. Haven't you got some hope now? We just, have to, our team has taken out the, well, I suppose not the worst foe in all of Mordor, but the second worst foe in all of Mordor. Big win for the home team there. Like huge, huge win. Aren't you happy now? Frodo says now, because... I'm still tired and the ring is still so terribly heavy and we still have such a terribly long way to go. And I begin to see it in my mind all the time, like a great wheel of fire, a lot of mythological significance for the, the wheel of fire there. But I don't necessarily believe that 
I don't necessarily believe that Tolkien is drawing mythic reference here. He generally doesn't in his work, right? In part because of his desire to create an aggregate mythology for England, for Britain in general, but England specifically, he doesn't really connect out to other mythologies. He doesn't really draw, I mean, there's obviously a lot of Anglo-Saxon stuff and there's a lot of Norse stuff, but generally speaking, he'll, he'll edge away from specific symbolic reference. I think this is a throw forward to the last appearance of the ring in the book, which hopefully we'll get to at the end of tonight's session. Yeah, we'll almost certainly not get to at the end of tonight's session, which is just fine. So Sam, once again, taking heart for his, for his master here and trying to help Frodo. He looked at his master anxiously. He took his hand. Come, Mr. Frodo, I've got one thing I wanted, a bit of light, enough to help us. And yet, I guess it's dangerous too. Try a bit further, then we'll lie close and we'll have a rest. But take a morsel to eat now, a bite of the elves' food, it may hearten you. The eating of food, obviously, is going to, to help keep Frodo on his feet and help keep him moving forward. Sam, of course, will not eat at this time. This is pretty consistent for Sam through the rest of this reading. The, the self-sacrifice of Samwise Gamgee is nothing less than... Than heroic, I guess, particularly for a hobbit, particularly for a hobbit in these, these most dire of circumstances. But again, nothing can lighten the burden on Frodo. And it's easy to read this and I suppose to simply read it as Frodo being so deep under the Shire that no light can get to him, right? That, that's a pretty easy read. That, that Sam is still wide open to the world. Sam is capable of, of witnessing by proxy these things that are happening very far away and taking hope in them. Oh my god, someone killed the Witch King of Angmar. I wonder if one of the hobbits was present there. Probably not. That would be crazy. But someone has killed the Witch King of Angmar. Suddenly I feel more hopeful. Suddenly I can move on. I've got a little more strength. I can keep fighting just a little longer. Sam is open to the world. And and Frodo is not. Again, Frodo is trapped in the immediate now. He's trapped in just this, this tiny cocoon of his own experience, and the ring within that cocoon is growing ever larger. Sam can look west and see hope, and Frodo can't. That's a way beyond the mountains, he says. We're going east, not west, and I'm so tired, and the ring is so heavy. In part, we can read this as Frodo being just very deeply under the shadow. But I think we can also see it as just a different kind of conflict, that the shadow that lays on Frodo is specific in a way that the shadow that lays across, you know, half of Middle-earth on the dawnless day or across all of Mordor, thanks to the fume and the reek of Orodruin or the, the more metaphorical shadow of Sauron's direct influence or the still greater, uh, greater metaphorical shadow of the war in the West, the war for the ring, all of these things are true and all of these things are present, but Frodo, I think, is engaged in a different and much more personal, huh, I was going to say war, but I'm not sure war is the right word here, a, a different and much more personal torment. He is going to buckle under the weight of the ring. It is only a matter of time. Frodo has been clear on that now for Gosh, I don't even remember how long. Uh, certainly before we crossed, uh, before we crossed the, uh, the Dead Marshes, right? He was already feeling the weight of the ring, already unsure that there was any hope at all of them returning from Mordor, even if they were somehow successful in their impossible task. Frodo is not, I think, just less hopeful than Sam, and certainly not less open than Sam. He is less hopeful than Sam. He is less open than Sam. He is trapped in this tiny cocoon of the now, the tiny cocoon of his permanent and ongoing misery, right? This this blurred moment of now that stretches out infinitely in both directions, but does never change. That, I think, is is indicative of Frodo's Frodo's torment by the ring at this point and of course all the other things that are uh, that are weighing upon him but hey you know how we've been talking about Sam's here again gone again sense of hope let's look at perhaps the most powerful example of that there they sat and made such a meal as they could keeping back the precious lambus for the evil days ahead they ate the half of what remained in Sam's bag of Faramir's provision some dried fruit and a small slip of cured meat and they sipped some water they had drunk again from the pools in the valley, but they were very thirsty again. There was a bitter tang in the air of mortar that dried the mouth. When Sam thought of water, even his hopeful spirit quailed. Beyond the Morgai, there was the dreadful plain of Gorgoroth to cross. Now you go to sleep, Mr. Frodo, he said. It's getting dark again. I reckon this day's nearly over. Frodo sighed and was asleep almost before the words were spoken. Sam struggled with his own weariness, and he took Frodo's hand, and there he sat silent till deep night fell. Then at last, to keep himself awake, he crawled from the hiding place and looked out. The land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sly noises, but there was no sound of voice or of foot. Far above the Efelduath in the west, the night sky was still dim and pale. There, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. 
The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of that forsaken land and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. His song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, for then he was thinking of himself. Now for a moment his own fate and even his master ceased to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side, and putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. This glimpse of starlight and the hope that is once again rekindled in Sam's breast, and I'm being a little playful with Sam's here again, gone again sense of hope and purpose as we pass through Mordor, of course, this is much more significant. This is much more powerful than other examples of Sam's waxing and waning hope as he, he faces the long march to Erodruin. This is, well, this is it. This is the point. This is as close to the thematic heart of the Lord of the Rings as we're probably ever going to get, or at least this aspect of the thematic heart of the Lord of the Rings. What is the light? What is the shadow? It seems from Frodo and Sam's experience that the shadow is all-encompassing. Certainly the shadow has encompassed them for a long time now. The shadow has spread forth its influence and its darkness across the lands of Middle-earth, even up uh, up to and beyond, you know, Minas Tirith, into Rohan on the, the dawnless day. The shadow has spread, and yet in the end, there are lights in the universe. There are sparks of hope and of goodness and of purity that the shadow can never encompass. It can occlude them. It can eclipse them. But that's only from a certain point of view. It is only dependent on Sam's point of view that the shadow is evident in any way. If Sam were still standing in the Shire looking up at the night sky, he would have no sense of the shadow. Now, yes, the shadow may come to the Shire. The shadow may scourge all of Middle-earth. The shadow may consume all of Arda. But even if it consumes all of Arda, it does nothing to the stars. It does nothing to the sun. It does nothing to that light which exists in all directions all the time. And we've talked about this metaphorically in the past when we've been talking about eucatastrophe, right? We've been talking about that, that desperate catastrophe, that, that dark turn of events where all hope seems lost and it seems as though things go from bad to worse, oftentimes very, very suddenly, when the fight is done. Then there is a crack, and through that crack spills the light of grace, spills the light of eucatastrophe, spills the light of hope, because that light encompasses the whole world. And through experience, we can be cut off from it, but it is only that the light is occluded, that the light is eclipsed, not that the light is extinguished. That seems to be Sam's understanding here. The beauty of it smote his heart, and he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him, for like a shaft clear and cold the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. That, okay, if the shadow takes Middle-earth, if the shadow takes all of Arda, someday the shadow will pass, someday the shadow will fall, someday the light will shine again. He's not thinking now about himself and even his master. He's not thinking about their immediate needs or their immediate danger or their immediate burden, their immediate quest. He's not thinking about that stuff right now. He's remembering, oh no, the light is infinite and the shadow is a tiny and fragile thing that can be torn away by a wind out of the south. The shadow will always pass and the light will always be there. Light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. And then we get an interesting turn. His song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, for then he was thinking of himself. And God, I feel like I could do 15, 20 minutes on that one thought, but I'm not going to because we have many more slides to get through. But his song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, semicolon, for then he was thinking of himself. It was defiant rather than hopeful, not because he thought that there would be a good outcome, but because he knew there would not be a good outcome, he has done, as we've discussed before, and kind of passed through despair into defiance, right? The difference between despair and defiance is that with despair, you believe that the, the future is known beyond all doubt and you just stop. Like Denethor, you just succumb to it. When you are defiant, like Aomer during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, when the Corsairs appear and he thinks that the day has finally been, uh, has finally been ended for ill, right? He believes that, that uh, the forces of Sauron have, re have received this, this huge influx 
of reinforcements onto the field and he marshals his men around him to build a spear wall and to, to take as many of these bastard orcs and men with them as they can before they fall. That's defiance. He's still taking action. So Sam here is believing correctly or not, you know, your mileage may vary on this, but Sam is believing that when he was singing, it was an act of defiance. He was hopeless. He was despairing, but he was taking action anyway. Oftentimes, of course, that defiance creates the opportunity for you catastrophe. Oftentimes that defiance creates the crack through which the light can spill. See also Aomer back at the, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, yeah. Now for a moment, his own fate and even his masters cease to trouble him. This peace that Sam feels in this moment, the beauty of it smiting his heart, right? Even here in this forsaken land, as it says, he has genuine hope again. And his fear has been eased. His, his trouble has been eased. Now for a moment, his own fate and even his masters cease to trouble him. Even his masters, obviously, of course, at this point, we're accustomed to the fact that Frodo's fate is much more important to Sam than Sam's own fate. But nonetheless, the, the narrative voice reassures us of that fact. Now for a moment, his own fate and even his masters cease to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side and putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. And I love the specificity of that last thought, too. He cast himself. There is not some magic at work upon Samwise Gamgee in this moment. This is not a magical sleeping star. This is not, you know, Astro Sopophorus. Uh, I, I, I'm having trouble with that. Uh, you know, Astro, Astro Soma or something. Um, uh, trying to, you know, uh, weave a magical effect on Sam so that he will, he will then go and sleep. No. His fears have been allayed. Putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. Sam is the one doing this, right? This is action taken by Sam. He crawled back into the brambles, laid himself by Frodo's side, and putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. He has his hope. He has the reminder that the shadow is a small and fleeting thing and that light will always endure. And he chooses to sleep now. It's a powerful act from, from a stalwart hobbit, from an absolutely stalwart hobbit, yes. Um... Uh, Marshall saying, there's a direct result of Nordic influence on Tolkien, right? Uh, yes, Marshall, a ton, yes. But more specifically, Marshall continues, like in Norse myth, the gods are doomed because of Ragnarok, but they find out anyway, even if it's hopeless, because it's the right thing to do. Um, yes, because it's the right thing to do, not from even a kind of um, abstract or objective or external kind of, or not in accordance with an external moral schema. It's not the capital R right thing to do because there are capital M moral things to do in the universe, but rather it's in part because it is their nature. That is what they are. That is what they are for. And that realization of one's own true nature and demonstration of one's own true capability, I suppose, is very important in that idea. Yes, and that does speak to the Lord of the Rings, of course. It speaks to, you know, the, the excellence that we find in the hearts of elves and men and doughty dwarves and, yes, hobbits to even the smallest of us, Samwise Gamgee, can be great, can be, can be wonderful, yeah. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to call out there Morgai too. Uh, Morgai is used repeatedly throughout this, uh, throughout this uh, section of the book as we're traversing uh, Mordor here. Morgai is just black fence, as you would expect, right? More, again, we've seen that many, many times. Moranon is the black gate. Morgai is the black fence here. Okay, let's move on to another slide. 40 miles to Mount Doom. The wind of the world blew now from the west, and the great clouds were lifted high, floating away eastward, but still only a grey light came to the dreary fields of Gorgoroth. There smokes trailed on the ground and lurked in hollows, and fumes leaked from fissures in the earth. Still far away, forty miles at least, they saw Mount Doom, its feet foundered in ashen ruin, its huge cone rising to a great height where its reeking head was swathed in cloud. Its fires were now dimmed, and its students stood in smouldering slumber, as threatening and dangerous as a sleeping beast. Behind it there hung a vast shadow, ominous as a thundercloud, the veils of Baradur that was reared far away upon a long spur of the ashen mountains thrust down from the north. The dark power was deep in thought, and the eye turned inward, pondering tidings of doubt and danger. A bright sword, and a stern and kingly face it saw, and for a while it gave little thought to other things, and all its great stronghold, gate on gate and tower on tower, was wrapped in a brooding gloom. Frodo and Sam gazed out in mingled loathing and wonder on this hateful land, between them and the smoking mountain, and about it north and south, all seemed ruinous and dead, a desert burned and choked. 
They wondered how the lord of this realm maintained and fed his slaves and his armies, yet armies he had. As far as their eyes could reach along the skirts of the Morgai and away southward, there were camps, some of tents, some ordered like small towns. One of the largest of these was right below them. Barely a mile out into the plain, it clustered like some huge nest of insects, with straight, dreary streets of huts, excuse me, with straight, dreary streets of huts and long, low, drab buildings. About it, on, about it, the ground was busy with folk going to and fro. A wide road ran from its southeast to join the Morgul Way, and along it many lines of small black shapes were hurrying. "'I don't like the look of things at all,' said Sam. "'Pretty hopeless, I call it. Saving, saving that where there's such a lot of folk, there must be wells or water, not to mention food. And these are men, not orcs, or my eyes are all wrong.' Neither he nor Frodo knew anything of the great slave-worked fields away south in this wild, wide realm, beyond the fumes of the mountain by the dark, sad waters of Lake Nurnan, nor of the great roads that ran away east and south to tributary lands, from which the soldiers of the tower brought long wagon trains of goods and booty and fresh slaves. Here in the northward regions were the mines and forges and the musterings of long-planned war, and here the dark power, moving its armies like pieces on the board, was gathering them together." Its first moves, the first feelers of its strength, had been checked upon its western lines southward and northward. For the moment it withdrew them, and brought up new forces, massing them about Kirith Gorgor for an avenging stroke. And if, it, and if it had also been its purpose to defend the mountain against all approach, it could scarcely have done more. So the ruin of Gorgoroth here, as we're looking out toward Rodruin and Barador beyond. Nice little uh, narrative pull there as we as we uh, move out of, of Frodo and Sam's POV. We sense again that authorial intrusion, right? Is this the voice of Frodo just writing a little marginalia, a little narrative marginalia after the fact, after he and Sam have accounted for their experience in Mordor? Neither he nor Frodo knew anything of the great slave-worked fields away sl south in this wide realm, beyond the fumes of the mountain by the dark, sad waters of Lake Nurnan, nor of the great roads that ran away east and south to tributary lands, and so on and so forth, right? Neither Frodo or Sam knew about this, but I'm going to tell you about this because, well, we have to have an understanding of the force that is being marshaled here and what Mordor is. Mordor is not just a grim and desolate and blasted land, or at least this part of Mordor is, right? Northern Mordor is because, well, A, the fume and the reek of Mount Doom, right? The, the, the volcanic ash of Rodruin has ruined this, uh, this desolate landscape forever, if, if indeed this landscape was anything other than desolate before the coming of Rodruin. Um, but also, this is where the forges and the workshops and the barracks are. This is where the army is being marshaled. This is not a civil land. They are already within well, the largest military camp that Middle-earth has ever known. This is warfare on a scale that they can't conceive of, which is, I think, why they're having so much trouble with this idea that, that the the arrayed forces of orcs before them are, are present, yes, right? Uh, um, and if it had also been its purpose to defend the mountain against all approach, it could scarcely have done more. Oh, but these aren't guards for the mountains. Guarding the mountain, if it had been its purpose to defend the mountain, right? It's not its purpose to defend the mountain. Its purpose here is to marshal this army so that it can unleash a powerful avenging stroke against the host of the West first, so that it can take care of the uh, the bright sword and a stern and kingly face it saw. And for a while it gave, thought to, uh, it gave little thought to other things, right? Sauron is preoccupied with the host of the West. He is specifically preoccupied with Aragorn because he still believes that Aragorn bears the ring. And if Aragorn bears the ring, then probably all of this great host of Mordor is for naught. Probably this host of Mordor can do nothing against Aragorn in possession of the ring, but this is what he's got. This is the hope that he has. So he is trying to crush the uh, the upstart rebel scum before Aragorn can can wield the ring uh, to to cast Sauron down. Yeah, yeah. Let me see here. Catching up again with the chat. God, you guys, you guys have. Uh... <laughs> You guys have so much to say tonight. Uh, the dark sad waters of Lake Nernan, says Jackie. Oh, what an existence. No kidding. No kidding. Um, oh, Varig of Khan, crediting that to a light Gondorian editing of the original Hobbit's text. Yes, uh, certainly it was. Uh, the uh, the Red Book of Westmarch did find its way to Gondor. So yes, it could well be that. I, I quite like that. Yes. The suburbs of Mordor, says Jackie. Yeah, no, th that's it. Good. Erica says, <laughs> Erica says, yeah, an hour in, we're not even to chapter three yet. Shakes my head at Alistair's optimism. You know what? As I've said before, as I think I've said in the last couple of chats, you guys, our reach should exceed our grasp. Or what's a heaven for, right? The, the, the Browning tells us all things about scheduling internet uh, internet class discussions, as we've learned. Okay, we have two more slides here in chapter two. We are not going to make it all the way to the end, but I do think we will make it to Sam's conversation with himself about the cracks of doom. 
maybe not even that far. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. But yes, next time we will wrap up uh, the cracks of doom. We've come to a dead end, Sam," said Frodo. "If we go on, we shall only come up to that orc tower. But the only road is the only road to take is that road that comes down from it, unless we go back. We can't climb up westward or climb down eastward." And we must take the road, Mister Frodo," said Sam. "We must take it and chance our luck. If there's any luck in Mordor, we might as well give ourselves up as wander about any more or try to go back. Our food won't last. We've got to make a dash for it." "All right, Sam," said Frodo. "Lead me. As long as you've got any hope left, mine is gone. But I can't dash, Sam. I'll just plod along after you." Before you start any more plotting, you need sleep and food, Mr. Frodo. Come and take what you can get of them. He gave Frodo water and an additional wafer of the waybread, and he made a pillow of his cloak for his master's head. Frodo was too weary to debate the matter, and Sam did not tell him that he had drunk the last drop of their water and eaten Sam's share of the food as well as his own. When Frodo was asleep, Sam bent over him and listened to his breathing and scanned his face. It was lined and thin, and yet in sleep it looked content and unafraid. Well... Here goes, master, Sam muttered to himself. I'll have to leave you for a bit and trust the luck. Water we must have or we'll get no further. Sam crept out, and flitting from stone to stone with more than hobbit care, he went down to the watercourse and then followed it for some way as it climbed north, until he came to the rock steps where long ago, no doubt, its spring had come gushing down in a little waterfall. All now seemed dry and silent, but refusing to despair, Sam stooped and listened and to his delight he caught the sound of trickling. Clambering a few steps up, he found a tiny stream of dark water that came out from the hillside and filled a little bare pool, from which again it spilled and vanished then under the barren stones. Sam tasted the water, and it seemed good enough. Then he drank deeply, refilled the bottle, and turned to go back. At that moment he caught a glimpse of a black form or shadow flitting among the rocks away near Frodo's hiding place. Biting back a cry, he leapt down from the spring and ran, jumping from stone to stone. It was a wary creature, difficult to see, but Sam had little doubt about it. He longed to get his hands on its neck. But it heard him coming and slipped quickly away. Sam thought he saw a last fleeting glimpse of it, peering back over the edge of the eastward precipice, before it ducked and disappeared. Obviously, their circumstances are growing still more dire, still more dire. Sam gives Frodo the last of the water and his share of the food and then sneaks out, leaving Frodo to sleep in order to gather more water, which he manages to do, which is no small task in the blasted ruin that is Mordor. But then returning, we get, well, the reintroduction of an old friend, an old enemy. This, of course, is Gollum. And though the narrative voice here is somewhat oblique, I believe that Sam understands that it is Gollum. I believe that Sam at least suspects that it is Gollum. It was a wary creature difficult to see, but Sam had little doubt about it. He longed to get his hands on its neck. Sam had little doubt about the fact that it was there, the fact that there was actually a creature, or about that creature's identity. And of course, the hands about its neck is a, a callback to previous discussions that we've had, or previous discussions that we have had about Sam and Gollum. But it heard him coming and slipped quickly away. Sam thought he saw a last fleeting glimpse of it peering back over the edge of the eastward precipice before it ducked and disappeared. Gollum's going to be pretty relevant as we move forward, you guys. Um, okay, I do want to catch up with uh, with the last uh, handful of slides here. Um even though Frodo, his ma uh, excuse me, this is from Erica. Even though Frodo's his master, and I think older than him, the way Sam takes care of Frodo reminds me of a mother taking care of a child, particularly when he wakes up. Frodo, I think that um, I think that Sam would be very touched by that. I think that care is care. It is a gentle care. It is a loving care. It is, I dare say, even an affectionate care. You know, for all of the. Um, for all of the Tumblr posts about the uh, the romance between Frodo and Sam, uh, and and you know the the triviality of that observation, I suppose the the misunderstanding of that observation, I suppose um, there is no doubt in my mind that of course, of course, of course, Sam loves Frodo. Of course he does. It's not a romantic love, and it's not even quite a familial love, though I would argue it's closer to that than most other forms of love. But yes, it is It is the love of a ma of a servant for his master. Sam loves Frodo, and Frodo loves Sam too. You know, it is that, that reciprocal arrangement is only good and virtuous when it is reciprocal, right? An uncaring master cannot demand the loyalty of a devoted servant, not really, not truly, not positively. So there is that connection. But Erica, I, I like that read very much. I think that's pretty great. Yeah. Okay, let's... Um, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Marshall uh, observes in response to Erica, I think there's a nurturing element to Sam's treatment of Frodo. Oh, the chat scrolled and I lost your thought there, Marshall. Do forgive me. Uh, Marshall says, I think there's a nurturing element to Sam's treatment of Frodo that modern masculinity is distinctly uncomfortable with, and it's done his best to relegate to a feminine mode. 
Yeah, a, a thousand percent agree, Marshall. Yes, you are absolutely right. The, well, of course, we've talked about this throughout the Lord of the Rings. We've talked about this throughout Tolkien's work in general, I suppose, going all the way back to Bilbo offering provision at the party for the dwarves and the unexpected party right at the beginning of The Hobbit, right? We, we've talked about the giving of care and the receiving of care among a cast which is predominantly male, right? As we've discussed before, there just aren't that many women in the pages of uh, in the pages of the Lord of the Rings, and basically no women at all in the pages of The Hobbit. So we get a perspective on masculine interaction and masculine friendship, I suppose, which is in no way tainted by that modern toxic. I was going to say some more profane words than that, but I'll, I'll try and restrain myself. That modern toxic masculinity. Yes, we are generally much more comfortable either recognizing Frodo and Sam's relationship as a subtextually sexual relationship that actually he is, that Sam is romantically in love with Frodo and, and, and all of his care for Frodo springs from that much more recognizable to modern eyes, much more recognizable kind of, of, of interaction, or that we are rendering his service in more feminine terms. Right. I, I think because that makes it harmless, right? That then it isn't a threat to our, our toxic calcified maladjusted ruinous sense of what masculinity is and should be provision throughout the pages of the Lord of the Rings in particular is a powerfully positive trait that is almost never gendered. Eowyn provides, or should provide, right? Eowyn is, a, I suppose, a specific example and maybe a weird place to start. Arwen provides, not just in the crafting of the banner, of course, but in care and in goodness. Galadriel provides. Yes, this is, this is true. They provide sustenance and comfort and care and, yes, a kind of love that in modern texts we would perhaps reactively and and small-mindedly render in more exclusively feminine terms or more specifically feminine terms. But we also get that from Sam consistently throughout the entire book. We also get that from uh, from Aragorn in his kingly fashion. We get it from Merry and Pippin to each other. We get great love and and responsible and respectful adult male relationships in The Lord of the Rings, which, while yes, I think it's unfortunate that we get those relationships and almost or, or very little to balance them. We get very few, you know, sophisticated feminine relationships in, in Tolkien's work and, and well, almost no feminine relationships in the sense of, of two, uh, two women, you know, being friends and, and having conversations. Like, does the Lord of the Rings actually fail the Bechdel test? It might actually fail the Bechdel test. I have to think about that a little more. But in any case, um, it's, it's, it's a shame that we don't get more on that side of things, but the masculine relationships are very good and, and, and very thoughtful and respectful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see here. Um, Good. Uh, Mary at Crick Hollow, Bjorn in his house, says R. Faramir. Yes, yes. We're just calling out great examples. That That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, Artful Fox is asking, wait, does Gollum understand the whole cast it into the fire to destroy it uh, premise? I think I always just assumed he knew the deal, but now that I think about it, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't think that he does. I don't think that... Um, Remember that he originally thinks, up until Kirith Ungol, Gollum originally thinks that Frodo is going to return the king, uh, return the ring, excuse me, to Sauron. That that's either that he is intent on returning the ring to Sauron. That is, Frodo has fallen so far beneath the sway of the ring that it is manipulating him into going to Barad-dûr and returning it to Sauron, or that he is trying some crazy stunt to to cast down Sauron from from Barad-dûr and take his place as a Dark Lord. But he will lose, and then Sauron will get the ring anyway. It doesn't seem to cross Gollum's mind that the ring will be. Destroyed, but of course it wouldn't. It doesn't cross Sauron's ring that the uh, Sauron's mind, excuse me, that the ring will be destroyed. This seems to be an unthinkable thing. Jackie says, I think this is also an issue with the modern idea of friendship. Our relationships aren't always as layered and complex as they should be because we don't do feelings well. We're often too shallow in order to maintain a level of comfort. It's problematic. Gosh, Jackie, yes, I completely agree. I think that there is a there is a great suspicion leveled upon friendship in the modern world um and of course in in modern fiction which tends to exaggerate the impulses of the modern world but also thereby codifying the 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 uh, way that we approach these relationships yes friendship is is a a complex thing in in modern society and in modern human interaction for reasons which I do not completely understand. Partly it is the suspicion of the the implicit assertion I suppose that all friendships are anchored in 
a subjugated romantic or sexual impulse, right? This goes back to the whole uh, when Harry met Sally idea, right? Can men and women just be friends? Yes, actually, it turns out that men and women can just be friends, that men and women can exhibit for each other a a completely um, unintrusive and, and unfrustrated affection and love and care and intimacy that has nothing to do with romance or sex or any kind of, of yes, thwarted desire for more. The toxic idea, and this is, I, I don't know this well enough to talk about it within the feminine sphere, but I can absolutely talk about it with authority within the masculine sphere. The idea that friendship is a is a kind of fallback position, that, that friendship is not something that is possessed of innate value. It is a compromise. It is a consolation, in a sense, is just, yes, just vile. I mean, we don't have time within the uh, within the span of, uh, of there and back again, unfortunately, to unpick all the problems of the modern world. But God, go be good friends, you guys. Just go out into the world and be good friends. And if there are people that you like and respect and trust, reach out to them and form a friendship with those people because friendships are fantastic. And I genuinely don't know why we are so suspicious of them in the modern world. Like, Yes, yes. Be be like, well, okay, maybe not Sam. Be like Mary and Pippin, okay? Like, because I say not like Sam only because the relationship, yeah, we can't ignore the hierarchical relationship between Sam and Frodo. But yes, be like Mary and Pippin. Be the very best of friends. Be like Legolas and Gimli. Be the very best of friends. And maybe don't go slaying so many orcs, but you know, you do you. If you want to go play like darts or, or mini golf or something like that, that could be great. Yeah. Um, good, good. All right. Um, that is, is that the end of the chapter? That is not the end of the chapter. That was Sam slipping away from the dead end. Now we get to the end of the chapter. They had gone some miles and the road was at last running down a long slope into the plain when Frodo's strength began to give out and his will wavered. He lurched and stumbled. Desperately, Sam tried to help him and hold him up, though he felt that he, felt that he could himself hardly stay the pace much longer. At any moment now, he knew their, world, their end would come. His master would faint or fall and all would be discovered and their bitter efforts would be in vain. I'll have that big sleeve driving devil anyway, he thought. Just then, as he was putting his hand to the hilt of his sword, there came an unexpected relief. Uh, they were out on the plain now and drawing near the entrance to Udun. Somewhere in front of it, before the gate at the bridge end, the road from the west converged with others coming from the south and from Barador. Along all the roads, troops were moving, and the captains of the west were advancing, and the Dark Lord was speeding his forces north. So it chanced that several companies came together at the road meeting, in the dark, beyond the light of the watchfires on the wall. At once there was a great jostling and cursing as each troop tried to get first to the gate and the ending of their march. Though the drivers yelled and plied their whips, scuffles broke out and some blades were drawn. A troop of heavily armed Uruks from Barador charged into the Durthang line and threw them into confusion. Dazed as he was with pain and weariness, Sam woke up, grasped, uh, grasped, uh, excuse me, grasped quickly at his chance, and threw himself to the ground, dragging Frodo down with him. Orcs fell over them, snarling and cursing. Slowly, on hand and knee, the hobbits crawled away out of the turmoil, until at last, unnoticed, they dropped over the further edge of the road. It had a high curb by which the troop leaders could guide themselves in black night or fog, and it was banked up some feet above the level of the open land. They lay still for a while. It was too dark to seek for cover, if indeed there was any to find. But Sam felt that they ought at least to get further away from the highways and out of the range of torchlight. Come on, Mr. Frodo, he whispered. One more crawl and then you can lie still. With a last despairing effort, Frodo raised himself on his hands and struggled on for maybe twenty yards. Then he pitched down into a shallow pit that opened unexpectedly before them. And there he lay, like a dead thing. Frodo and Sam escaping from the, uh, escaping from the orc company in which they unwillingly found themselves. Um... It's, it's so dark. It's so bleak. Reading this chapter, it is almost impossible not to feel this burden of hopelessness, this oppression, I suppose, that is afflicting both Frodo and Sam in their journey toward, uh, toward Rodru. And here getting caught up with the movement of the forces, for the captains of the West were advancing and the Dark Lord was speeding his forces north. He is hurrying in his response to the coming of the host of the West. And here we see in several ways what is an increasingly significant minor theme in The Lord of the Rings. That is the self-destructive facility of evil. The fact that evil will, in the end, always consume itself. That is going to be spectacularly important in what I guess is going to be the end of our next session as we move into Chapter 3, Mount Doom, but is also very important here, has also been very important here, right? Uh, the 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 fighting between the orcs back at, at Kirith Ongol, the, uh, the fighting, or the, the, the lack of trust between the orcs, the Uruks, and the fighting Urukai of Isengard. And now we see again, well, a double confluence here, right? Because 
Sauron is urging his forces north because he believes in his arrogance that Aragorn has the ring and that this tiny force sent out from Minas Tirith, the 6,000 men that make it to, uh, that make it to Moranon, that this tiny force is led by the returning king, correct, bearing the ring, incorrect. But Sauron, in his arrogance, seeks to address this threat by throwing all of his forces recklessly toward it. And because he is throwing all of his forces recklessly toward it, we get this this tangle, this traffic jam here, uh, right outside the entrance to Udun, right? Where we're driving these different um, different regiments, different companies into one another. And of course, a fight breaks out, which allows Frodo and Sam to escape. This is the self-destructive tendency of evil made manifest once again. Yeah. Okay, let me see here. Where are we? Uh, as I'm catching up, <laughs> Becca saying, wait, are you trying to tell me that two humans can enjoy each other's company and not have sex? You would be amazed the number of people, Becca, with whom I have enjoyed company and not had sex. It's, it's startling. It genuinely is. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, um, good, good, good. Let's, uh, oh boy. We're getting into a whole nother thing here, as, as Glowinson uh, says, when I take our daughter to theme parks by myself and people ask, where is mommy? Oh my God, the, yes, the uh, push against the notion that fathers can be parents too, that fathers ought to be parents too. One of the very few things in the world, like I think over the course of 66 episodes of There and Back Again, you guys have probably learned that I'm a man of, of pretty even temperament and pretty positive outlook, right? Like I am an optimist and I love people. These are true things about me. One of the things that is guaranteed to set my teeth on edge, make my hackles rise and make me lose my temper, fathers in particular referring to taking care of their children as babysitting. That makes me crazy. We can't talk about all of this, you guys. I need to start another podcast just where we could talk about all of these attendant issues in The Lord of the Rings. But yes, that makes me absolutely furious. Glowinson, good job at taking your daughter to theme parks. Congratulations. I hope that, that both you and she have a genuinely lovely time. Um, okay, you know what? I think what we're going to do, this is the end of chapter two. Chapter three, I've got a lot of material for chapter three, of course, because I've pulled basically every word of chapter three because I absolutely had to. So I think what we're going to do is end our reading this week here. Let me make the scheduling announcement then. Let me cancel this slide and uh, come back to you. And then we'll dip into the question bucket for just a moment. That's going to give us with uh, about a regular length show, which will be a nice, uh, a nice consistent episode of There and Back Again, though not at all consistent in tone and topic this evening, I suppose. Next week, I am on hiatus. There will be no live there and back again next week. The following week, rather than returning with chapters four and five of book six, we're just going to return with chapter three of book six. Let's get together and do, uh, do Mount Doom next week. Chapter three of book six. We're going to go in great depth. We're going to talk about um, the introduction of Rosie Cotton, which is a really weird beat that happens here. We're going to talk a little more, actually, about the history of Sam as he's looking back and remembering uh, the Shire. We're going to talk about Gollum. We're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about pity. And then we're going to talk about the final UK catastrophic turn, if not the greatest you catastrophic turn, the Battle of the Palinor Fields, still probably up there as far as that is concerned, we are going to get just a, a genuinely gorgeous and perhaps even more influential you catastrophic turn in uh, at the end of chapter three of book six of the Lord of the Rings. So I hope that you will be able to join me there. Let me uh, check the date there. That is going to be 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central on June the 21st. As I say, no Taba next week. Uh, I, I hardly ever say Taba in these podcasts. That's how I think of it. No there and back again next week. There and back again the following week. That's June the 21st for chapter three of... Uh, of book six. Let me take a look here in the question bucket. If I can get the question bucket to open, I will. There it is. Okay. If Sam truly thought that Frodo was dead when he took the ring from him, says Erica, why didn't he become the new owner of the ring? Does the ring want to stay with Frodo because he was the owner for much longer? Um, I think Sam did. My, my reading of this is that Sam did become the new ring bearer, is that um, this is part of part of the ring's reluctance to be passed back to Frodo, right? If we think about, if we credit the ring with any kind of, of sentience and sapience at all, if we credit the ring with any kind of agency at all, it makes no sense for it to want to say with Sam versus being returned to Frodo. Frodo is already in an incredibly weakened state. Frodo is an easy mark for the ring at this point. Like most of the work is done. He just needs a little shove over the edge and then he belongs to the ring forever. Sam has outright rejected the ring in the very recent past. And yet when we, in the, the slide that we read, uh, first of all, this evening, when we get to Frodo in his, uh, in his prison chamber, Sam hesitates. He doesn't want to return the ring. I suppose I should give it back to you. Right. And he's drawing it out slowly. And he 
does return and but he returns it with a well you know it's super heavy now maybe we can share it i read that to be the influence of the ring i don't at no point prior to this even when sam has been excuse me even when frodo has been struggling under the weight of the ring at no point prior to this has sam expressed an eagerness to bear the burden for his master bearing the burden for his master in fact has seemed an impossible thought for sam He's there to accompany Frodo, not to bear the ring, but the ring obviously, or, or, or to my eyes, at least perhaps not obviously, perhaps there is a bit of a, a bit of close interpretation that we can do there. But to my eyes, the ring wants to stay with Sam rather than be returned to Frodo, which I take to be proof of the ring's innate desire to stay with the ring bearer, right? Unless the ring violently doesn't want to stay with the ring bearer, but even then it prefers not to be like passed on. It wants to take more permanent action on its former hosts, I suppose. So for me, no, Sam absolutely counts as a ring bearer. Sam counts as the only ring bearer who has, without an asterisk, willingly given up the ring, right? Yes, Bilbo gives up the ring to Frodo, but he does so only under the, the very gentle and powerful insistence of Gandalf. And he does so, we must remember, in the heart of the Shire. Bilbo gives up the ring when its power is at its least. Sam gives up the ring when its power is at its absolute greatest. Sam is utterly exceptional in this regard, right? The strength, the will that Sam displays in that moment. I, I, I feel that to, to, um, to deprive Sam of that moment is to diminish Sam's achievement in that moment, right? We should also talk, of course, about the claiming of the ring. Bilbo is well aware, Bilbo, yes, technically finds the ring, but he is also well aware that he is stealing the ring when he takes it, which does put him under a bit of a shadow. But of course, the fact that he spares Gollum, as, as Gandalf tells us all the way back in the second chapter of Fellowship of the Ring, the fact that Bilbo spared Gollum out of pity actually meant that the ring had much less hold on him than it would have done otherwise. If he had taken the ring with, you know, accompanied by an act of violence, then the ring would have progressed in its domination of Bilbo much more swiftly, Sam has an even easier time of it because he doesn't even believe that he's stealing it. He believes that he is actually taking up a burden on behalf of his master. Like it's almost impossible to think of a better circumstance in which one might take ownership of the ring, right? Deagle finds it innocently. So we can kind of credit him. The ring probably would have taken even longer to corrupt Deagle than it did to corrupt Smeagol into Gollum, right? The five centuries that that, that Gollum is, is lurking under the Misty Mountains in the possession of the ring. Deagle takes it innocently, right? Isildur doesn't... <laughs> I'm just going to rewind back through here. Sauron, of course, does not take it innocently. Sauron creates it consciously. Isildur doesn't take it innocently. He does take it by right, though, right? It is, it is, um, it is a, uh, it is a blood price in effect for uh, for his father. So he's taking it with a sense of righteousness, but it is also a, a, a seizing of the ring that is accompanied by violence. Deagle gets it completely innocently, just finds it floating at the bottom of the river. Smeagol kills for it, which is a pretty sharp left turn. Bilbo finds it, but is aware very shortly thereafter that he is stealing it. And then he passes it on to Frodo, who again, I suppose, takes it innocently, but not without takes it innocently in the sense of of moral culpability, I suppose, but not innocently in the sense of ignorantly. He's well aware of what the ring is shortly after it comes into his possession. And even before it comes into his possession, he's aware that it's a, a, a powerful artifact. So these circumstances are very different. Sam takes it best, though, I suppose, right? Sam picks up the ring with the very best of intentions out of all the ring bearers that we've seen and gives it up apparently pretty easily, right? He is, when, when Frodo um, apologizes, Sam is, is weeping as if stung to the heart by his master's words. It's not the giving up of the ring that has, that has wounded Sam. So it's being called a thief by his master. This is a pretty terrible thing. Yeah. That at least is, is my read of it. Um, yeah, our Faramir, of course, observing that, yes, looking ahead to the end of the book, uh, that Sam does actually, quote unquote, count as a ring bearer. Yes, he definitely is. Yeah, yeah, good. That's, uh, again, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Um, Wilhelm Scream saying, uh, do I suppose that first time readers were shocked that by this point, Sauron himself had not actually shown up in the book for, you know, some climactic lightsaber battle or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely do. And I have had conversations with people who feel exactly that way. Hey, you know, the problem with the Lord of the Rings is that there's no bad guy. The problem with the Lord of the Rings is that that, that Darth Vader just sits in his little, uh, little egg cocoon and never comes out for that climactic lightsaber battle. Yeah, because it's not about overthrowing Sauron, right? The, the, it's very tempting to read the Lord of the Rings as though it were a modern fantasy novel because 
so many modern fantasy novels, the entire genre of fantasy has been redefined, reshaped, informed, textured, given life, certainly given commercial popularity by The Lord of the Rings over the years. This book has absolutely changed the landscape. So it is always tempting to kind of retrofit the, the tropes and the conventions and the structures and the preoccupations and the thematic conflicts that are common in modern fantasy onto The Lord of the Rings. And pretty much every time you try and do that, it falls apart. Why is the climax going to happen in next week's reading? Why is the climax of the action of the story going to happen in chapter three of book six? Because that's not really what we're here. We're not here for a simple, a simple good versus evil story. The Lord of the Rings is not a good versus, uh, not a simple good versus evil story. It is not a simply plot driven adventure story. It is something far larger than that. It is much more like a faux history than it is a simple adventure story in the modern sense. It is, it is just more complex and, and more sophisticated than that. Now for all of that, does the book suffer? Is, is the reader's experience lessened or diminished by the absence of Sauron from the climax of the story? I don't think so. There are perilously few direct direct accounts of Sauron's actions, right? We're getting them more now, but we went for most of this book without any direct acknowledgement of Sauron whatsoever. Certainly no, you know, Sauron POV shots. We don't, uh, we don't get the flash to the eye as we do in the movies all the time, right? We, we have this, this constant visual, physical sense of Sauron in the movies as, as we need to, because it's a movie. So you kind of need that visual sense. Otherwise, what are we doing? Um, but in the book, we're ignorant of the specifics of Sauron's action and engagement for almost the entire book. Really, in, in book five, we get we get some hints, we get some suggestions, right? I suppose even back in in, in uh, The Two Towers, we get like a couple of veiled references, but we're never sure. We're never, we're never that clear on what is happening. Sauron is an unknowable evil. He is an unmeasurable foe. And that's not the story we're telling. That's not the battle we're fighting. So... I, I, I like it very much. Actually, I like that Sauron is abstracted out almost to the point of being the essence of evil, right? The, the essence of the shadow. I kind of like that he's not just incarnated. I like that we don't get a classic, as you say, lightsaber duel, either with Vader or the Emperor or Kylo Ren or, you know, Snoke. Snoke. Um, <laughs> kind of tipping my hand about my feelings about The Last Jedi there, I know. Um, I, I kind of like that he is is more abstract than that because the effect of that abstraction on the actual text, I think, is that we get to stay anchored in the small scale of the Hobbit story here. And when we are focused on the host of the West and the Battle of the Black Gate and that side of the story, it's not about Sauron either. It's not about a single defeatable bad guy. It's about his his influence it's about the the host that he can set forth it's about the overwhelming odds of of uh of even opposing let alone defeating Sauron. so i actually like what this does for the story but i do think it's surprising in in your first read through that well no he just doesn't show up he's not lurking there in the 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 uh, the caverns of fire there in the heart of Orodruin. well that's weird why why did we even come this way no we're we're keeping things at a hobbit level which is the function of golem arguably for the entire book right i guess we maybe won't have time to talk about this next week so we'll maybe talk about it now. The function of Gollum in the entire book is to give Bilbo in the first instance and then Frodo and Sam in the second instance, I would argue, a Hobbit-level antagonist. Gollum is not scary to anyone else in the book. Faramir could take Gollum apart in a moment. Aragorn could take Gollum apart with a thought. Gandalf probably wouldn't even need a conscious thought in order to take Gollum apart. He is not a scary antagonist by the standards of, of the Lord of the Rings, right? By the, by the standards of the larger plot of the Lord of the Rings. But he is a perfect antagonist for the Hobbit plot. He is a Hobbit-sized antagonist, and that that makes him perfect for the, this, this final resolution that we'll get to next week. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Last question here from Artful Fox. Artful Fox, I hope... That, oh, okay. We've got two more. Since Artful Fox and Jason both have asked questions, and this is your first time here, I'll, I'll answer both of these questions. Artful Fox asks, if Frodo had actually died and Sam no longer had a master to bear the burden for, since that's usually his primary motivator, do you think his strength would have wavered? Or would he have been able to complete the mission despite the strengthening power and temptation of the ring? Really interesting to imagine that if it had been written that Sam had to save the day and personally fulfill the rest of the journey, the final test without Frodo being a factor. Wow. Um, gosh. Do I think that in the absence of his loyalty to his master, well, see, that's the trick right there, Artful Fox, actually, I think 
is that even if Frodo had died, Sam's loyalty to his master would have endured. It would perhaps have been all the stronger. I don't necessarily think <laughs> see that that's a, that's a weird thought that I can genuinely tell you I've never had before. I have honestly never considered this for a moment. If Frodo had died at Kirith Ungol, would Sam's odds of destroying the ring have actually been higher? Would that million to one chance have come down to like a 600,000 to one chance? I feel as though it might because A, Sam would have been able to move more swiftly without Frodo, right? He would have been able to elude capture more freely. He wouldn't have had to worry about his master. And the hold of the ring over Sam is nothing like as full or as complete as the hold of the ring over Frodo. But I do believe, to, to answer the question directly, right? If Frodo had actually died and Sam no longer had a master to bear the burden for, Sam would always have had a, a master to bear the burden for. I think that would have been true if, if Frodo had died in Kareth Ungol. I think it would have been true if Frodo had died in the, in Ithilien or in the Dead Marshes or, or you know, even back at, at uh, Parth Gallen. I think Sam would have borne the ring to, to uh, Orodruin and cast it into the fire himself. Yeah, I, I, I do. I don't know that his chances would actually have been much better. Um, hmm. Hmm. No, I think so. I think so. I do wonder about Sam's interaction with Gollum in that particular circumstance, but but I guess we'll we'll get to that discussion in next week's reading because, of course, we actually get the confrontation between Sam and Gollum. Thank you, Artful Fox, for a fascinating question. Let's do the last question of the evening here from Jason. Uh, what do you draw from both Sauron and Saruman being Maiar of Aule, and how the Noldor, the most gifted craft-wise of the elves, are the group of Eldar who fall under the shadow? What is the connection between craft and vulnerability? Great question, Jason. Great question. Of course, uh, you're familiar with this, Jason. I'm, I'm sure since you're you're, you're referencing the uh, the allegiance of uh, of both uh, Sauron and Saruman to Aule, or the, the the connection between these characters and and Aule. Aule starts this right right in the beginning of the Silmarillion when we get the the creation of the dwarves of Aule and Yavanna. We get the first kind of creative impulse. The first, well, mm, okay, not creative. I want to be careful about this. The first craft persons, the first crafting, the first crafty, I suppose, uh, act of creation in Middle-earth that stresses the framework of the Ainulind Lady, that stresses the framework of creation itself. The creation of the dwarves was not supposed to happen, but the thing about crafty people is that they are they are skillful, right? They are, are possessed of a ability and an intellect that is not sufficiently tempered by wisdom. And I think that you can see in the pages of the Silmarillion a great interaction between Ale and Yavanna that, that, that uh, as we pair off the Valar, you know, uh, so often the Valar work better in their primary pairs that that, that just seems to be a kind of uh, a theological part of, of Tolkien's framework here. But as we pair Ale and Yavanna, she absolutely tempers him. She, he has the the intellect and the creative ability, the, the the crafting ability there, but she has the wisdom, and that is what runs rampant in both Sauron and in Saruman, right? The, the, the whole notion of, uh, notion of Saruman, right? The, 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 um, the depredation that is done upon Isengard, the, the line from Gandalf that we get about uh, he who breaks the thing to, you know, has left the path of wisdom. Like, all of this stuff speaks to the suspicion that we have about, <clears throat> about not crafting in and of itself, right? Dwarves craft, elves craft, even men in their rough and crude and often unfinished fashion craft. They, they are makers of things, but they are makers of things tempered with wisdom. We do not seek to make things for... Uh, remember all the way back in the pages of The Hobbit, this is one of the distinctions that we draw between the goblins of the Misty Mountains and the dwarves of Erebor, right? They both make things. They both make weapons. They both have industry. They both have, have machinery. But the difference is that the dwarves create jewelry and things of beauty and the goblins then the orcs of the misty mountains create weapons of mass destruction right they create explosives and they create terrible terrifying weapons that is because they are creating without wisdom and without an appreciation of beauty appreciation of beauty by the way and wisdom appreciation of beauty appreciation of tragedy and wisdom pretty much all three synonymous in the pages of the lord of the rings i might argue the dwarves have that sense the elves have that sense it is not that that being 
a craftsman, a craftsperson is bad. It is not that creating things is bad. But if you are creating things and you are disconnected from the light of creation, then you can only mock and not make to bring us full circle in tonight's discussion. The problem with Sauron is that he is not engaged in an act of authentic secondary creation. Um, You've perhaps read uh, the the poem that Tolkien wrote for C.S. Lewis, Mythopoeia, right? Where he talks about this notion of creativity as, as being like refracting the light of God. The only creative light is the light of God. All creat creativity in, in Tolkien's understanding of the universe comes from God. It is refracted through the prism of each individual human being so that we can add or, or not add, cause our own hues and colors to be represented in, in the, the, the light that flows forth from God. We ourselves are not creating. We are simply channeling the creative power of God. That is true of Tolkien's concept of creativity, both in the real world, in his personal life, in his professional life, and also within the frame of, of Middle Earth too. If you are cut off from that light though, then you cannot make you can only mock, you can only twist, you can only deconstruct rather than meaningfully, permanently, positively construct. Aule was not cut off from the light of Iluvatar, but he could have been. If not for the grace of Iluvatar and the creation of the dwarves back at the beginning of the Silmarillion, then that, I mean, that could have gone just very differently, right? That, that, that's, that, could have, that could have broken bad real easily. It has broken bad for Sauron. It has broken bad for Saruman. That is a, a really great question. And of course, the Noldor too. Um, yeah, I, I suppose there is a, um, there's a specific question. Oh, I want to hold off on the Noldor. I, I want to hold off on the Noldor until we until we get to the summer really and really break that down. But I would point to pride. I would point to pride as also being a thread of the elevation of one's own creativity into that that divine space. I suppose, right? People who create positively do not mistake their creativity. Their, their secondary creation for primary creation. Let's put it that way, right? They, they do not create their, their work of craft or of art as an act of authentic capital C creation in the way that God created the universe or the, the you know, in, in whichever kind of fictional or non-fictional realm you're, you're, you're dealing in that moment. Um, they never elevate themselves to that level. People who break bad in, in, in Tolkien's uh, conception of, of creativity in particular, pride is oftentimes a part of their downfall. That is oftentimes the way, in fact, in which they are severed from that original light of creation, is that in their pride, they seek to elevate themselves rather than simply channeling that light that is that is poured upon them. That was a surprisingly profound uh, topic of conversation right here at the end of the show. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for your question. Guys, I hope you had a lovely time, particularly Artful Fox and Jason. I hope you had a lovely time joining us for the first time tonight. Um, let me see. Someone was saying, um, yeah, C Star saying, uh, Summerlyan Primer, Summerlyan Primer. Can you keep promoting that Summerlyan Primer that's on tour.com? Go read the Summerlyan Primer that is on tour.com, you guys. Yeah. Uh, the Summerlyan is extremely dense. We are going to get to it some fine day. Next on There and Back Again, not next week, but the following week. What did I say? June the 21st, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. We will move into chapter three of book six of the lord of the rings we will get to the cracks of doom i hope you will all be able to join me for that this has been an absolute pleasure and an absolute blast i hope you guys have a great week and a great next week have a great two weeks in fact and i will talk to you all again very soon until there take care <laughs> until then even take care and <laughs> fly you fools